What's Shaking Fire Nation? JLD here with the Entrepreneurs on Fire July 2020 Income Report. We have a lot of fun things to discuss today. We're going to hear from our CPA, Josh from CPA on Fire with a great tax tip. We're going to hear from our lawyer, David Lizabram, with a great legal tip. We're going to be talking to you about what Kate and I have been focusing on while we've been, quote unquote, quarantined in paradise, as well as breaking down all of our revenue, all of our expenses and giving you our biggest lesson learned for the month as soon as we get back from thanking our sponsors. Clavio is the e-commerce marketing platform that helps brands build relationships with memorable email and SMS messages. Today, more than 40,000 brands like Living Proof, Kopari Beauty, and Huckberry choose Clavio to help them grow. Learn more and get started with a free trial at Clavio.com slash fire. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash fire. All right, Fire Nation, let's kick things off and First and foremost, what was our July income at a glance? Well, our gross income for July was $170,492. Our total expenses were a clean and lean 33K for a net profit of $137,000, which was an increase of $5,000 from June, mostly because of that lean expense report there. And our percentage net profits to overall gross revenue was 81%, which is my happy place. 80 plus percent is my happy place. So I'm loving where that's at. We're going to keep trying to focus on that number and above. And I know we won't always hit up Fire Nation, but we always can try. So we have a lot of great stuff to talk about that I teased in the introduction, but let's dive right in with Mr. CPA on Fire's July tax tip, which is, is a monetary gift taxable? Josh, take it away. Everyone right now is thinking, how do I get a monetary gift? So Hmm. can't help you there, but let's start with, is it taxable? And, you know, starting a business can certainly cost money. Uh, you, there's, there's a lot of Internet-based businesses today that cost far less than businesses used to cost. But, John, you know, you, you, you started a podcast and you still put some money into getting Truth. that business going, Truth. right? Equipment, everything involved. And for most people, those startup funds are going to come from one of two sources. Either you save up your own money over time, you have some cash on hand and you pay cash, or you take some type of business loan, some type of startup loan, and, and you use the money that way. But for some of us, for the lucky few of us, there are generous people in their life willing to give them some type of gift, some type of startup funds to get this going. All right. And every year I get multiple questions along the lines of uh, my, my great uncle Leonard gave me a monetary gift to get my business started. Does he get a tax deduction for that? And or maybe even do, do I have to pay taxes on that? Those are that's usually how the questions evolve. And. That gives me, I have to give a little bit of bad news, some good news, but a little bit of bad news there. Uh, First of all, the good news, you are not going to be taxed on receiving that gift. They could give you $10 million and you are not going to pay taxes on that gift. So great news there. Bad news is not only is great uncle Leonard not going to get a tax deduction for that, he could end up paying taxes on that Mm. gift. So yeah, that's right. They're going to tax the person giving the gift, not the person receiving it. Right. And I know that seems a little strange. Why would the person giving it? But you got to think there's some some parents that were pretty wealthy could just pass money down to other people with lower income tax brackets, all that stuff. So the IRS is thinking ahead like like they always do to make sure they're maximizing their taxes. All right. But let's look at the situations here. So if the gift is over fifteen thousand dollars to one single person, the person giving the gift will have to fill out a gift tax return and potentially pay taxes on it. All right. So. A little bit more good news here. There are several ways to potentially avoid paying any taxes on those gifts. I'm going to run down a few scenarios here on how that can happen. First of all, the $15,000 limit is per person. This means if you are married and or the person receiving the gift is married, you can double or quadruple the gift tax or the, the, the gift free tax. All right. Here's an example. A married couple wants to give a large gift to their son who is also married. They can give $60,000 tax free. Right? The dad can give $15,000 to his son and another $15,000 to his son's wife, and then his spouse can do the same thing. So a grand total of $60,000 to the same couple tax-free. Okay, so great scenario there. John, I know you were kind of wondering how you could give my wife and I more money in a gift, and, and that's the way. So we'll I was thinking I was just going to have to like marry more people or something. Right. Well, that's a great – That's a great. That's, <laughs> I never thought about that, but that's all 
also <laughs> a very valid option. Um, and I can marry more too. We'll just keep expanding. <laughs> um, second of all, they can, the person giving the gift can take five years worth of gift exclusion for a single person in a single year. All right? This means that you can give $75,000 to that one single person in a single year without taxes. Right? You would then not be able to give an additional gift to that person for the next five years. You're just getting an upfront gift five years in advance. But this is a great way if someone wants to give you a large gift to start a business, not have to fill out a gift tax return, or at least not pay taxes on it, you would be able to do that. So a great scenario there. And finally, what's going to get most people, unless they have very, very, very generous Uncle Leonard's, a gift-free tax, uh, a tax-free gift, is that you can use a lifetime gift exemption of $11.58 million. So, John, I know you want to give me $12 million, but we're going to have to scale that down <laughs> just a little bit. All right. So this obviously is going to eliminate almost every person that wants to give a gift to someone to start a business or for whatever reason from paying taxes. But there's two things you have to note on this exemption. First, you do still have to file a gift tax return if you exceed that $15,000 gift per person, All right? So you can use that exemption, but you still have to file the return if it's over 15,000. And you just have to note that you're, you're using your lifetime exclusion there. And second, this gift exemption is going to reduce your tax-free estate by the same amount, okay? So the, you, can, you can have a tax-free estate when you pass away up to 11.58 million, or you can use it in advance for a gift for someone. You cannot use both. Right, but this is, again, a very generous gift by the IRS. Um, I mean, some people might say, yeah, so generous of them to let you give your money to whoever you want. But, you know, it is what it is. They're going to allow you to do that here. You've got to do it smart. If you're lucky enough to have someone that's going to give you that money, do it the right way so they don't pay taxes on that very generous gift. Right? And I know what many of you are thinking on this tip. We should all be so lucky to get such a big gift that we have to worry about the tax consequences. All right? But for many people, it is reality, and, and they do have that scenario. So someday when your business is thriving, you could be the one looking to give the gift, right? And this is how you do it. This is how you do it tax-free. Make sure you're crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's so you don't get hit with taxes. But if you do it right, you can give that gift or receive that gift with no one paying taxes. All that makes sense? Makes sense. Couple quick questions. So yeah. 11.58 million, do you want cash or check? What's your preference? Let's do it in increments under 10,000 so that we just don't do any transactions to the IRS. <laughs> and also that 11.58 million, that's kind of a random number. My other question is, does that keep going up a percentage with inflation? Yeah, it tends to go up uh, a little bit every every whenever Congress decides to to raise it. Um, as with everything, they they look at cost of living and inflation and 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 all that good stuff. But the true moral of the story is just don't tell your great uncle Leonard about anything until after he gives you money. Exactly. Yeah, the, <laughs> get him to commit to giving the money, then you can figure out the tax consequences. Anything else at all, Josh? Before you let us know where we can find out more about your awesome tax tips, and then we'll say goodbye. No, I mean there's there is new stuff coming out with a potential new stimulus plan. So I'm sure as soon as that passes, we'll tackle it on the next income yeah. report. But other than that, we'll talk next month. CPAonfire.com. Of course, you can email Josh directly, josh at cpaonfire.com. Josh, as always, thanks for the tax advice and we will catch you on the flip side. Mr. David Lizerbram is on the mic right now and we're gonna be talking about a topic that we get asked a ton, and I mean a ton, in our Podcast Paradise Facebook group. You know, people really seem to get stuck on this for various reasons, so much so that we actually just created an incredible post on this topic that is now super highly ranked. It's one of the top ranking uh, posts in all of Google about this topic, which is how to register a podcast name. So if you just want to search for that, um, you're going to be able to learn what David is talking about today and more. Plus, we're going to be linking to David and his services on that page as well. So David, take it away. Well, thanks. And I definitely recommend people check out that post because I can get into some of the details here, but I definitely can't uh, address everything as comprehensively as Kate and I did in that post. So uh, definitely uh, check that out. Um, okay, so your uh, great uncle gave you a gift to start your business, uh, <laughs> and uh, or you just saved the money like everybody else or whatever you did, and you're ready to start your business. You're going to launch a podcast. You have to have a name for your podcast. It can't just be nameless. And um, people constantly ask me, just like they asked John Kate, uh, how do I register my podcast name with a trademark, or do I have to register it? Do I have to trademark it? What do I have to do? So I'm going to try to kind of clarify a few of those things in this uh, talk. So the first thing to know is that 
uh, a podcast name, like anything else that identifies your business, is a trademark. It falls under trademark law, not copyright, not patent, not anything else. Trademark law is what you need to know about. Um, so the most important thing that people need to know, and I've repeated this in the past, but I'm going to repeat it again, is that in the U.S. and many other places, trademark rights go to the first person or company that uses that trademark for similar goods or services. So what that means for you in this particular conversation is if somebody else is already using that same name for a podcast or something similar, it doesn't have to be identical, um, but similar enough that somebody might be confused between the two, um, then uh, the person who did it first typically gets rights. First come, first served. I mean, it's really like playground type rules. Most things in the law are more complicated than that. But this is actually <laughs> um, something that even my three-year-old might be able to understand. <laughs> um, so, um, and if you want to hire him for his legal services, uh, you're certainly welcome to uh, negotiate with him. <laughs> but he's okay. even more expensive than his father, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I can't afford him. Yes. You don't want to you know, try to call your podcast Entrepreneurs on Fire with a Z or something like Ooh. that you know, and, just, and try to sneak past John. I mean, we're going to know. Um, so you know, just come up with a unique name that nobody else has used. Um, that's the first thing. All right. So you have a name for your podcast. You're ready to go. Um, and then the question is, do I have to register it? Do I have to quote unquote trademark? Okay, what do I do? So definitely consider the benefits of registering your trademark. So if you're in the U.S., you can register your mark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. If you're in another country, every country has a trademark office. Um, and uh, there definitely are benefits to it. I mean, if if there is a dispute, if somebody comes along and says, hey, that's infringing on my name or I have it, I had that idea, whatever the case may be, having the trademark registered doesn't guarantee you're going to succeed, but you definitely have the benefit of the doubt in under the law on your side. It's sort of insurance in the case of a legal conflict, and it gives you a lot of other benefits too. I'm not going to get into every single benefit of trademarks. Um, you know, the downside side is, uh, depending on how much your Uncle Leonard gave you, there is a cost to registering a trademark, um, and those costs can vary. And trademark registration is pretty tricky. I mean, I've been doing it for almost 20 years on a daily basis, and I still see new things. Um, so it's definitely the type of area where you might want to consider hiring a trademark attorney to handle it for you um, or to advise you on it. Um, so uh, you know, there are costs involved, but the benefits can be really huge. So Let's just get down to a little bit more of that nitty gritty. Do I need to register a trademark? Um, lots of podcasters ask that. The answer is that if you're starting a podcast and this is a new business, it's not connected to any other brand, you haven't done anything, uh, a lot of people at that stage when they're launching, they don't register their podcast name as a trademark, and that might be okay. I mean, I'm not giving legal advice here, but I'm just saying everybody doesn't have to automatically register their podcast name as a trademark immediately or they're screwing up. It's not like that. Um, you need to weigh the pros and cons for your business and what you're doing. If this is an existing business that you're making money from and now you're expanding it into a podcast, all right, and that situation, you probably want to, uh, you know, do everything you can to protect it because you've got an existing business to protect. So you're going to want to definitely register that. Or if you already know you're going to monetize this, you have it all figured out. Maybe you already have ads lined up. You've got, you know, a name or something that gives you the opportunity to do that. All right, maybe then you really want to dig in and invest um, in the registration. Otherwise, if you're just launching and you're kind of taking a flyer, you're like, all right, I'm going to put a few episodes out and see how it goes, and and hopefully it takes off. You know, th then it might be advisable in your case to wait a little bit and just see if it takes off and. And then go ahead and jump on the registration. Um, you know, the, there, you are running a risk there that somebody could register ahead of you, and then it could be pretty costly to try to fight that and get your rights back. So, you know, there's risk to everything in business. And again, I'm not uh, your lawyer just because I'm talking here, and, and so you got to decide what's right for you or talk to your legal counsel. Um, but the reality is that every single podcaster can't necessarily or it doesn't necessarily make sense for them to register right away. So think about it. Read the post that we put up uh, uh, in Podcasters Paradise. Um, and uh, if you have further questions, you're not sure if this is right for you or if you think, hey, this is right for me and I want to make sure I get it done right, feel free to reach out to me, David Lizerbram, lizerbramlaw.com. Uh, if you spell anything close to David Lizerbram, <laughs> you're going to find me. Um, so uh, you can uh, you can figure it out or the show notes to this uh, the to the uh, income report will uh, will have the link to my contact and I will always talk to any uh, member of uh, Fire Nation uh, you know I'm always happy to schedule free uh, a free chat and so uh, if you just have questions or you need a little bit of guidance 
don't uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Remember, Fire Nation, a quick free chat with David, but his son, that's going to cost you because let's oh, be yeah. honest, he's the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but Fire Nation, myself and David, for anybody out there who got a little spark of an idea with that entrepreneurs on fire with a Z, we have three words for you. We'll find you, and we will find you. <laughs> Decent assist. Those are three more words. <laughs> three, okay, a total of six words. Obviously, David, thank you so much for sharing this. And like uh, he said, Fire Nation, if you're in Podcasters Paradise, we have that post in the Facebook group. If you're not, you can actually just search for the words how to register a podcast name. And we are actually the number one result. I just checked in incognito mode and all of Google for that, how to register a podcast name. So a great post by Kate and David with some more details. So definitely check that out. And David, thank you as always. Fire Nation, make sure lizardbramlaw.com is on your bookmarks so you can have him on speed dial for any questions you may have on that side of things. And we have a lot more to talk about as soon as we get back from thanking our sponsors. Hiring is challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart, where businesses can connect with qualified candidates. Take Codable's co-founder, Gretchen Hebner, as an example. Gretchen experienced how challenging hiring can be after unsuccessfully searching for a new game artist to grow her education tech company. But then she switched to ZipRecruiter and saw an immediate difference. And you can too by signing up for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash fire. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. By using ZipRecruiter screening questions to filter candidates, Gretchen found it easier to focus on the best ones. In fact, after posting her job on ZipRecruiter, Gretchen says she was honestly surprised she found quality applicants so quickly and hired a new game artist in less than two weeks. With results like that, it's no wonder that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Just visit ZipRecruiter.com slash fire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash fire. ZipRecruiter.com slash fire. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. This message comes from our sponsor, Clavio. If growing an e-commerce business is your focus, you need a platform that's focused on growth. That's where Clavio comes in. Clavio is the ultimate e-commerce marketing platform for online brands of all kinds and sizes. Whether you're just getting started or running a well-known brand, it gives you everything you need to send memorable branded emails, text messages, and more so you can build strong relationships that keep your customers coming back. With flexible automations, powerful insights, and super precise targeting, Clavio is a faster way to turn great ideas into great customer experiences. And these experiences are real money makers. Brands made more than $10 billion in revenue through Clavio last year. That's why it's trusted by more than 40,000 brands like Living Proof, Huckberry, and 8 Sleep. Want to learn more about how you can grow your brands with Clavio? Visit Clavio.com slash fire to get started with a free trial today. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash fire. All right, Fire Nation, welcome back. And I know it's been way, way too long since you've heard the lovely voice of Kate Lynn Erickson. So I'm going to pass the mic over to her and she's going to chat about what went down in July, specifically test, check, ditch, double down. Kate, take it away. Whoa, what's up, Fire Nation? Super excited to be on the mic with you today. Thanks so much for tuning in with us. Um, just a reminder, you can catch everything that we're talking about today over at eofire.com forward slash income 83. And I'm going to dive straight in to what John just mentioned, what went down in July in the EO Fire studios, much like you with lockdown continuing throughout the U S and I know in many other countries, you know, everything's kind of up in the air right now. And especially here in Puerto Rico, we just went kind of back into, uh, another little lockdown uh, phase, if you will. And you know what? We've actually been looking at this as an opportunity to turn to projects in our business that we've been considering back burner items for quite a while now because without the lockdown and COVID and everything that's going on in our world today, 
uh, we're usually traveling and going to conferences and we have all these other commitments throughout the year, right? And again, like many of you, uh, many of those commitments and those travels and the conferences and all of that have either been moved online, completely canceled. And that has made it possible for us to look at these projects and to be able to bring them to the forefront, which has really been great. And I think that you know, I, I wanted to talk about this this month because it's important to consider what you can create space for during this time. I know that it's frustrating and I know that there's all kinds of moments in time where maybe your motivation isn't super high or whatever the case may be. But I want you to stop today and ask yourself the question, what does this new time and space make possible for you? And for us, it has made a lot of SEO and optimization projects possible because John and I will be the first to admit right here on this income report that a lot of these SEO and optimization projects have been pushed to the back burner during quote unquote normal times when we're traveling and we've got conferences and tons of other commitments. And so bringing these projects to the forefront has allowed us to do a lot of testing, a lot of checking, a lot of ditching, <laughs> and a lot of doubling down. And we owe a huge thanks to the contracted SEO team and optimization team that we're working with right now, who has helped us not only identify these projects, but kind of help keep them on track. And John, you and I have been doing loads of work diving deep into these projects and considering, are they moving the needle? What what movement and forward progress are they helping us create? And if they aren't helping us make forward progress, we ditch them. If they are, then we double down on them. And over the past month, in the month of July, I feel like we were able to accomplish so, so much. And I wanted to name a few of those things that we're focusing on, like website speed, broken links on our site, cleaning up our redirects, optimizing our top podcasting content, this team has helped us create an entire content plan for the next year, which has been super helpful in kind of giving me that extra push uh, to create new content. And we've just kind of embarked on and wrapped up. I mean, it's really incredible looking at all of these tasks, John, how much we've been able to accomplish Seriously. in just one month. But also this huge project of adding value to other sites that we've been featured on. And... I, again, I know that this sounds like a ton of stuff, but when you have clarity and a plan in place around the projects that you want to accomplish, then your progress is inevitable. And I just want to reiterate, not only have we been able to use this time and this space to dive into projects that are important to us, but just haven't been a priority until this point, until we found this new time and space. And then also, once you do identify those things, what type of plan can you put in place and who can you ask to hold you accountable so that your progress is inevitable? So again, I really want to stress this really simple, but potentially like huge changing question is what does this time and space make possible for you and your business? John, what would you say just kind of like looking back at everything that we worked on in July and all of this testing and ditching and doubling down that we've done? What's kind of like you're coming up for you as big takeaways from this? Big takeaways is that this just needs to be something that's always on your rotating to-do list, like things that you just kind of have there. So you're continuously having a finger on the pulse just so that you're not having all of the these months and then what honestly ends up into years of you going by without doing any of these things that you really know are key to your business but are so really just easy to forget when you have other things you're focusing on, other projects you're working on and other things. And I think a great example is optimizing our top podcasting content. I mean, there's no reason that we as a a uh, great website that launched back in 2012, really became some of the leaders in the podcasting space in 2013 when we launched Podcasters Paradise, the book Podcast Launch, and then of course, free podcast course, and we're running weekly webinars on podcasting, and you know now we've launched a couple years ago the Podcast Journal, which is doing great. But, you know, we let other people, other competitors sneak up on us when we weren't really paying attention and severely outrank us on really critical and key podcasting terms and search queries 
that are driving a ton of traffic to their sites, to their products, to their courses, which frankly aren't as good as ours. I mean, we have the best podcasting course in the world, period, end of story. We know that. Everybody who's in Podcast Paradise knows that. But how is anybody to know that that's never heard of us, but that just goes to Google and queries how to start a podcast and we're buried somewhere on page three when, again, that's because we took our finger off the pulse, not for weeks, not for months, but for years. And we really, really failed in that. And we wouldn't have, if going back to what I was talking about at the beginning, we just had that as one of our key things that we just at least had to talk about on a monthly basis. Like, hey, what are we doing in this area that we know is really important for our overall business, for the overall leads, for the heart and soul of the revenue that we're making in our business, which is through Podcasters Paradise and serving people in the podcasting space. And all, all the things that go into that. Other things to talk about that I won't go into super in depth on, but you know, your website, as it gets bigger, it gets more bloated. And so we have broken links everywhere. Our website speed wasn't great. Our mobile optimization wasn't great. These are just all things that are happening again while we're focused on other things. And these things don't happen overnight. They happen over time. So you just have to know what your core important drivers are in your business Great user experience on both mobile and desktop for our website is very important for our business. We failed there multiple times over the years, and we've been able to really improve there in just one month. And it just is crazy to see what we've done over one, two, three months and how vastly improved all those scenarios are, but it never would have come to that if we had just been able to keep our finger on the pulse of the right things. We've just been a lot of times distracted by the wrong things or distracted by the right things, but we're just not forcing to carve out time for things that we have to be carving out time for, for things like this. So that's kind of my big sum of my rant. And before we get into the income breakdown, why don't you kind of wrap up this section, Kate? Yeah, absolutely. And we're not talking about all this stuff to be like, oh my gosh, everybody needs to be like paying attention to their website speed and broken links on your site and cleaning up your redirects and, and all of that. Like, These are all, yes, very important things to have like good website health and to make sure that your user experience is as good as it can be. And like John said, you know, we should have been kind of having our finger on the pulse of all these things since the very beginning, but we didn't know any better. Um, We were focused on other things. We had um, our list of priority and an SEO team wasn't a part of that. An optimization team wasn't a part of that. So I hope that when you hear us talk about these things on the income report, I mean, we're literally sharing with you the mistakes that we've made and the lessons that we've learned in hopes that we can help you kind of, um, you know, cut those off before they actually happen the way that they've happened to us. I mean, eight years later, when we look at broken links on our site, that's been, you know, over 500 blog posts and thousands of show notes pages and all of these links that we've been building up. I mean, of course that's going to happen. So how can you start right now and today put a system in place so that you're checking on these things once a month or once every other month or having a VA check for you, having um, maybe a consulting team like the consulting team that we've hired, who's kind of helping you keep a finger on the pulse of those things. So yeah, really great lessons learned for us this month. I'm going to be talking a bit about the 80-20 rule, which carries on well with this and our biggest lesson learned for July. So John, I'll let you go ahead and do the income breakdown. Let's talk about July 2020's income breakdown. Starting off with our journal sales, we had a great month. We did over 500 sales of our journals, which is huge, over $15,000. Uh, the Freedom Journal brought in 141, the Mastery Journal brought in 117, and the VIP of the month, the Podcast Journal, 245 podcast journals sold. So key, so amazing, awesome stuff. And Podcasters Paradise, which is the number one podcasting community in the world, we welcomed 21 new members. We have a total of 165 recurring members for a total revenue of $22,225 for the month. Our podcast sponsor, 
sponsorships. Once again, crushed it, bringing in $75,000. Our affiliate revenue was $57,000. Uh, we brought in $12,000 via ClickFunnels. We brought in $7,700 for KBB with Tony Robbins. Um, $19,800 for another course that we promoted called Crush It With Challenges. So that was a, a really good month for our affiliate course promotions that we've done. And our expenses, again, were just over $33,000. We've listed every single expense out at eofire.com slash income83. So please check those out. And our total net profit was a cool $137,440, keeping us over the six-figure mark for 83 months in a row. Super, super cool stuff. And as Kate promised, we're going to be talking about refocusing on the 80-20 rule and the biggest lesson learned. So Kate, take us home. Yeah. You know what? I actually want to go back real quick because I recognize that sometimes the amount of detail that we put into the numbers in our income breakdown is very thorough, but sometimes there might be some things where people are like, wait a second, that doesn't really add up. And I, I feel like Podcasters Paradise might be one of those things because we have nearly 4,000 members in Podcasters Paradise. But as we list out our revenue, we have, you know, over 165 recurring 21 new members this month. So how does that work? Well, for probably like the first three years that we launched Podcasters Paradise, I think five years, five years. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. So we were offering lifetime memberships lifetime. during that time. So we've finally gotten to the point now where all of those lifetime members have paid off their memberships. And so they're not included in the numbers that we show on the income report. And that's where like a disparity in number of members, you might be questioning something like that. So I just wanted to mention that because it stood out to me, John, when you were talking about the number of recurring members and new members. So um, yeah, with almost 4,000 members in the community now. Holy cow. It's like one of my favorite things of my morning sweep is going into the group and checking out what everyone's up to. It's yeah, so fun. that Facebook group is great. And I was actually just remembering when you were talking about that, when Greg was visiting us here in 2017, when we were actually talking about making that shift into away from lifetime and into this recurring model, which is really interesting. And um, that's, you know, just one of those things, Fire Nation, that you are going to see as your business evolves. You're going to be trying new things, testing these things out because, you know, at the end of the day, y your business needs to evolve just like the economy and the world is evolving. So absolutely great point to bring up, Kate, and take us home. All right. So refocusing on the 80-20 rule. So again, we talked about like there being a lot of things up in the air and nobody's really sure what the rest of 2020 is going to look like per se. And so focusing on core projects has been challenging and, you know, focusing on a lot of things has been challenging during this time. And I look back at this month and kind of try and distill some of the things that stood out to me the most. And I feel like one of my big takeaways this month is how important building your discipline muscle is. Because when your willpower might seem a little bit low and you would love to do anything except focus on a single task or a project, um, that discipline muscle becomes critical to helping you make progress, even when you might not really feel like it. And as I was thinking about that and getting back into projects and being able to say like, okay, I might not necessarily feel like doing this right now, but I know once I get my mind and my headspace there, then I, I can crush it. Right. So it's, it's mostly like, not even allowing yourself to say no and just starting. And that reminded me of the 80-20 rule because there's so many things in our business that if we can continue to focus on the 20% of our efforts that result in 80% of our results, 
then we can continue to have a massive impact impact on inspiring millions of people, which from the beginning has been kind of our North star and also continuing to live a life of freedom. Like that is why I do what I do to accomplish those two things. I want maximum impact for others. And I want to live what John and I preach, which is time freedom, financial freedom, lifestyle freedom, the freedom to do what I want, when I want, and with whom I want. And so anytime I'm not feeling so motivated, which might kind of be like a recurring feeling for a lot of us these days, reminding myself of this really does help. I think about what my why is, and then I think about those core projects that we've dedicated ourselves to, that we've committed ourselves to, that we know move the needle for our business because we've set aside the time to actually look and say, what are the 80% results that are coming from just 20% of our efforts. And when you can focus in on those things, you'll start to make such massive progress in such a short period of time. I've heard this from entrepreneurs over and over and over again. If you take the time to, to step back and give yourself the space to consider what it is you're spending your time on right now, and you actually sift through that and look at the 20% of your efforts that are producing 80% of your results and you double down on that, your life and business will change. So I highly encourage you to consider that. How is the 80-20 rule playing in your business right now? And if your answer is not at all, then you know exactly what you need to do. Take that step back, look at what it is that you're working on, identify those core projects that really move the needle for your business and ditch everything else. Boom. I mean, Fire Nation, if you're sitting there saying that was just a whole bunch of value bombs, well, number one, you're right. And as Kate ended very eloquently with that word ditch, it reminds me to remind you, Fire Nation, that I know you're listening to Entrepreneurs on Fire right now. You also need to be listening to Ditch Busy. This is Kate's podcast where she talks about making overwhelm a thing of the past. So just go to wherever you listen to Entrepreneurs on Fire, type in Ditch Busy, and these type of value bombs Kate drops in very concise, clear, and incredible format. So definitely check that out. And Fire Nation, we are going to have another month of very interesting times ahead of us. So definitely stay tuned to the podcast, definitely stay tuned to the blog, and definitely stay tuned to our next income report, which will be coming at you in about another month. And until then, we will catch you on the flip side. Clavio is the e-commerce marketing platform that helps brands build relationships with memorable email and SMS messages. Today, more than 40,000 brands like Living Proof, Kopari Beauty, and Huckberry choose Clavio to help them grow. Learn more and get started with a free trial at Clavio.com slash fire. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash fire.